the greatest expression of breakthrough came after the church came into a place of peace. Can increase come through persecution? Yes, of course. But persecution is plan B. I saw a sign this week that I liked. It had, it had a picture of the universe and it had a picture of earth. And the caption read, Miss Universe Contest, 62 winners from earth, none from the rest of the universe. my attempt at a sense of humor getting beyond a third grade level up into fifth grade. <laughs> now back to third grade. A local, peace, a local priest and pastor were fishing on the side of the road. They thoughtfully made a sign saying, the end is near. Turn yourself around now before it's too late. They showed it to each passing car. One driver drove by, didn't appreciate the sign, shouted at them, leave us alone, you religious nuts. All of a sudden, they heard a big splash. They looked at each other, and the priest said to the pastor, you think we should have just put up a sign that says, bridge out instead? <laughs> oh, well. Back to third grade level. I'm back. Just... Paul, why don't you come up here and give us a report? We just had a great... Um... Yeah, bless Paul. So good to have you back in town. Just... Thank you. Yeah, we just had the medical healing conference, our fourth one uh, here in Reading. We'd had a couple elsewhere. And uh, to be honest, for me, it really began when I stood here 10 years ago and said surgery is not a second-class healing. That's actually where the concept of this began. A doctor contacted me after that and said that was probably the most significant advice that I'd ever received in my medical training because he felt second-class as a doctor wow. and uh, to the supernatural. And uh, and so that's really where it began. And then one day Bill was telling one of my favorite teachings of Bill now where he said that, you know, in the wilderness, everything was supernatural and that was just to sustain them. But in the promised land, it was the natural and the supernatural married together and that was to advance them. And I said to Bill when he shared that, I said, Bill, would you share that at a medical healing conference if we put one on? And so we did. And so we now had four. And uh, it's just wonderful. Anyone here from medical healing still here? There's a few of you. Wonderful. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wonderful to have you Welcome. here. It's a really safe place to be sick today. There's a lot of doctors around. And uh, uh, it's, it's very encouraging as well because I think one of the things that's happened with the Medical Healing Conference has been that uh, we've attracted uh, medical personnel to come and move to this region. A and we need help. We need another 50 doctors in the next two or three years. And uh, I think one of the things that's happened is that a church that demonstrates that it values the natural and the supernatural actually attracts doctors and healthcare professionals to come to a place where they know that they'll be loved and valued. And so we just had two days. It's a mixture of, uh, of teaching and, and training. But the favorite session for me will forever be uh, when doctors share miracle testimonies. There's nothing like it, nothing like it. The rest of us are a bunch of amateurs trying to remember the part of the body that may or may not have got healed. And uh, they, they shared uh, some incredible ones. I'll just give you uh, a few. Um, one was uh, a young woman and uh, she was uh, infertile. She had uh, no, none of the normal female hormones uh, in her body. And so uh, on examination, discovered that she also didn't have the normal female organs and particularly had no uterus at all. Now, I actually started her on some hormone treatment just so that she could hopefully just have an, a more normal experience of life and have the right hormones in her body. Uh, now, hormones don't make organs grow. They don't, that, they don't do that. So, so the, the OBGYN and the PA, of course, prayed. Um, they write fascinating things in the record, like insight given, which actually means word of knowledge was given. But you have to find a way of saying it in, in their world. And uh, the result was that that young woman um, who had no cervix, had no uterus, had, had no normal hormones, now is completely normal, healthy, fertile woman. That doesn't happen by drugs alone. With That's, the uterus. 
There's a uterus. They've got pictures, the whole deal. Incredible. Is that amazing? Amazing. Did you hear what he just yeah. said? There wasn't one and now there is one. Yeah, praise God. Wow. <laughs> I can tell you, if I was a woman, she'd be my doctor. That's all I'm telling you. That's if, I, if, if, I, if I was a woman lived in Reading, for definite, she'd be my doctor. Yeah, I mean, really. she's amazing. Another one, actually, the same doctor presented a, a case where um, the, the lady had, had miscarried, and they met all, not miscarried, so the baby, the baby had died in, in uterus, and met all of the parameters that indicated the baby had died, all of them. And, uh, and so they were getting ready for miscarriage and whatever might be needed to be done. Two weeks later, that, that baby was fully alive and that baby has now just celebrated the one year birthday. One year birthday, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> what, what's so great is, you know, I mean, obviously we all love people getting healed, but when this is happening in the doctor's office, and, and they're, they're working out, is this a patient I can openly pray for? Is this a patient that I quietly pray for? And they're doing everything right. But they have an interesting problem that we don't have in the healing rooms. They have to fill in the forms for coding the healing to send to the insurance company. So they've had to develop new language like spontaneous reversal of an expected miscarriage and things like that, you know? It, absolutely brilliant. So, uh, and uh, we had reports of... Um, uh, malaria, um, cerebral malaria being healed from a doctor who came, a uh, missionary doctor, um, a physical therapist who, who was um, caring for a patient that had a, a knee, they couldn't do anything with it, couldn't, couldn't heal it up at all, and ended up praying for the patient's knee, but what happened in the process was the patient's knee was healed, their blood pressure was healed, their, their heart problem was healed, and actually following that, uh, after a sequence of kind of... Uh, interrogation really by this physical therapist with the patient she ended up being delivered because she'd had a curse put on her by a, a neighbor who who was feeding her but was also feeding her some demonic stuff uh, in the process wow. and and watch this uh, uh, this patient do what Chris taught last year which is fascinating because Chris taught last year about sort of you know the the trifold healing of walking, leaping, and praising God. And this physical therapist gets to come back and say, I've seen what he preached. I've, I've seen that happen in, in my Amazing. office. And, and uh, one just quick final one. Couple came three years ago. And uh, one of the, I think one of the hardest things, actually I think it's hard for pastors, but it's really hard for doctors and healthcare professionals. If it, a relative is sick, and, uh, and this, uh, this couple... Um, their daughter was dying of a heroin overdose in hospital when they came to the healing conference about two or three years ago. And we gave a call at that conference for prodigals to return, and they stood by faith. Wow. A year later, uh, a friend of, of the mum said, look, when, when you had your daughter, you didn't have a prophetic baby shower, which apparently this community give prophetic baby showers, which I guess you're going to start now because that's Bethel. But, so they gave this mum a prophetic baby shower for their now 19, 20-year-old daughter. A year later, the daughter, who wasn't walking with the Lord, who'd been near to death with a heroin overdose, got married to the son of a pastor, is completely, fully restored, walking with the Lord. That's, that's encouraging. So wonderful. It's a wonderful time. One of my favorite things to be a part of. And uh, thanks for letting me share, Bill. Thanks, wonderful. Thanks for Bless sharing. God. Isn't that good? So good. Oh, I love it. Love it so much. That is so cool. Anyone who uh, has a terminal disease or uh, you have an immediate family member with a terminal disease, please stand. <clears throat> and we just, we welcome our Bethel TV family, community, join with us in this uh, as well. We want to make sure that you receive a ministry too. Also, anyone who has a child um, a immediate family member who is not walking with the Lord. Uh, why don't you stand as well? Because we're going to pray for these two things together before we um, move on in the meeting. Amen. It is just, it's time to see more and more and more restored. It's, uh, it's extraordinary to see what Jesus does in healing 
broken homes, broken lives. Um, church family, you know what to do. You got somebody standing by you. Go to them. Find out if it's a child, if it's a disease. Find out what it is and, uh, and minister to them. If you're standing for prayer and nobody is uh, praying for you, put a hand up and we'll get somebody to you. Okay, look around. Church, look around. We get hands up all over the place. Okay, as soon as somebody puts their hand on you, put your hand down. Back over here to my left, over here. Tons of people. Okay, we've got quite a few to my left over here. Between me and the camera, we've got several here, so I need some of you getting there. Beautiful. Thank you, Lord. There's still, there's still three or four more to my left. If I can get some of our team back in here. Crawl down the rows, do whatever you need to, right over here. Beautiful, thanks. Excellent. Now we declare that healing word, that healing word over people in Jesus' wonderful name. Restoration of homes, family members. I want you to call for that spirit of breakthrough to come upon that individual. Breakthrough. For the glory of God, we declare and pray for breakthrough right now. Jesus' mighty name. All right, you did really good. Bless them, hug them, do something nice. And uh, <clears throat> go ahead and take your seats. Thank you, Lord. I want you to open your Bibles, if you would please, to Acts chapter 9. We have a rather brief period of time to talk today, but it's really all I need. It's all that's in my heart. Acts chapter 9. Let me give you a context. I think it was about three months or so ago, I was, I was going through the book of Acts, and I I, uh, I ran across this verse that I realized is one of the rarest verses in the Bible. And the reason is because it describes increase to the church, increase by conversions, people being born again, increase to the church in a season of blessing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with church history, or how many of you are familiar with Bible history. It's just the rarest thing in the world. When, when blessing comes, people relax their values often. It's not required. <laughs> it's not required. But it often happens. Years ago, I remember someone telling us that the safest place to be in a war is on the front lines of battle. And the reason is because on the front lines of battle, you only care about certain things. You only care about having enough ammunition, keeping your head down, knowing where your friends are. At the back end of the battle, you care, you care about what is being served for dinner, what movie is being shown in the mess hall tent. Your values change. What's important to you is radically different. 
And that radical difference in values is what makes people vulnerable to weakness in spiritual matters. Learning how to maintain priority and focus in a season of blessing is one of the rarest things in church history. And so when I saw this verse, it, uh, it leapt out at me for, for that reason. <clears throat> and by the time you get to Acts chapter 9, it's somewhere between 5 and 10 years after the day of Pentecost. In the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, there was immediate resistance to what was happening. There was the increase of the church. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were born again. But opposition came immediately. What has happened through the early church especially is they learned how to navigate opposition so that it brought increase. Sometimes you'll read in history where opposition came and people became cowardly or they withdrew. We certainly saw that with the disciples in the Gospel of John after Jesus was crucified, the 11 remaining disciples met in a home and they hid out of fear. They, they withdrew. They were not in a place of advancement or increase. And throughout church history, there have been times where the church has increased and there's been time where it's retreated. But throughout the first um, many years, of, of the church since the outpouring of the Spirit in Acts 2. For many years following that, every wave of opposition that came was met with a greater resolve, a greater sense of devotion, greater purity, and greater demonstration of power. It's a remarkable thing because um, to navigate loss well means you can be trusted with gain. To navigate disappointment well means you can be trusted with fulfillment. Wow. So good. To navigate criticism well means you can be trusted with praise. Wow. To navigate betrayal well means you can be trusted with loyal friends. The Lord is always testing, not for, for the sake of failure or to mock, but to see what measure of glory can I carry? What measure can I live with? Because when, when that that glory rests on a sanctified life. It establishes it. But that glory, same measure of glory on an unsanctified life, crushes it, breaks it. And so the Lord is very careful with what he releases to people in the way of blessing. I, I, I don't have enough time to clean up my mess, so I'm just going to make one and you'll have to deal with it. It's my gift to you today. It's quite possible that your biggest problem that you face in life is connected to your biggest prayer. <clears throat> I heard recently <laughs> that our biggest problem in life is sometimes connected to our biggest prayer, the biggest thing that we've been contending for and praying for. There is a connection between being able to navigate the difficulties in life that prepare us for increase. Yes. I can look through the last 40 years of my life. I can, I can track it. I can track it. I didn't like it, but it is true that when you navigate well, you navigate the loss, the betrayal, the disappointment, you navigate those things well, the Lord then honors with the measure of breakthrough you've cried out for. And I'll tell you one thing that is so absolutely true Oftentimes, the measure of presence and breakthrough that we enjoy in life is directly connected to what we've become. Well, I've already told you I'm going to make a mess. So you just have to deal with it. Sometimes you have to try to discern how big a mess do you want to make. <laughs> Chris, don't, don't throw me a slow pitch, Chris. Don't, it's, it's too tempting. 
the Lord has, why does the Lord answer promise? Well, first of all, because he's truthful and he loves us, he cares for us. But there's another factor in the answering of promise that we don't always consider. He answers promise to display the greatness of his name. It's not just about us having a fulfilled life. It's about his purposes being accomplished in the earth by finding people that believe, that come into agreement. These wonderful stories that we just heard of earlier, a uterus being created. I just ran into a guy that was born with three, three kidneys. He's in a meeting at some, some sort of terminal disease. He was born with three kidneys. Two of them were bad. They removed two. He was left with one good one. And in this uh, conference, he received prayer. And, uh, and he was healed of this, uh, this uh, terminal disease. When they checked him out, they found out he had a brand new kidney. So he, he now has two, well, working good kidneys. Excuse me. I have friends in part of the world that don't know. Excuse me. All right, now it's off. I don't have near the attention span to endure a buzzing phone rattling on the podium. All right, let's, let's get. So we've got chapter two. We have opposition that comes. We have increase. It says, and daily people were added to the church. Chapter four, they are released. Uh, Peter and John are released from prison. They pray for greater boldness. And it was boldness that got them arrested, which is a completely different way of thinking. In a comfort-centered Western culture, we pray for, to be relieved from pressure and problems. Peter prayed for an increase. And increase came to the church. Chapter five, we have Ananias and Sapphira die because they lied to the Holy Spirit. That's an interesting altar call. The scripture says that none would dare join them uh, carelessly. You know, it was like they just didn't have a lot of visitors the next week. <laughs> it, just, it, it thinned out the tasters of what God was doing. And so we've got this kind of opposition comes again and then increase. Chapter six, the same thing happens again. This time, by the time you get to verse seven of chapter six, the disciples are multiplied. So we've seen addition. How many of you have seen addition? How many of you have seen division? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Addition, division, multiplication. So by the time you get to verse seven of chapter six, the same thing. Chapter seven, what happens? Stephen is martyred. And while Stephen is being martyred, being stoned to death, Saul of Tarsus, the religious leader, is off to the side, watching the garments of those that are killing Stephen. As Stephen is being stoned to death, he prays. And he says, God, don't hold this against them. What he did is he used his opportunity that he could have used to call down judgment, and instead he released forgiveness. As a result, the man who carried that spirit, if you will, of opposition to the church, the most zealous opponent of the church, Saul of Tarsus, was converted as a result of Stephen's prayer, God, don't hold this against them. See, the greatest conflict you face where there's other people involved, the, the willingness and the passion to release forgiveness is actually the very thing that releases that presence and anointing for revival, for breakthrough. It's not using the opportunity for personal gain or to vent, but it's using the opportunity to release the forgiveness of God. So Saul is, is converted. So we've got, we've got uh, opposition increase, opposition increase, opposition increase, until we get to chapter nine, until finally it stops. For a season there was no opposition. Verse 31 is our verse for this morning. We've got a few minutes left and see, if, uh, see what we can do with this. Verse 31, and the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. That was a whole new experience. Imagine wondering if you're going to be carted off to prison every day of your life. And then the guy who leads that military movement gets radically saved. And for the first time in your life in Christ, there's peace. 
That's what happened here. Then the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. They were built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord, I, I like how this translation puts it, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. The church came into a place of peace and edification. Walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Who's they? It's the churches. We had disciples added, disciples added, disciples multiplied. Now we have churches multiplied. The greatest expression of breakthrough came after the church came into a place of peace. We don't have time to study this. We have done it in the past, but we don't have time to study it today. But let me make reference because I want to put this in a context. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul gives instruction to Timothy and all the elders, all the leaders that are helping to lead this church at Ephesus. He's an apostolic leader at Ephesus. And he gives them this instruction. He says, all right, first of all, top of your list, he says, I want you to pray for those leaders those who are in authority, and do this praying with thankfulness. Paul is giving a word about giving thanks for leaders when he lived at a time when Nero would later burn Christians at the stake in his garden. And he's giving instruction pray for them and give thanks. And then he goes on in this, in this instruction. He says, pray for them with thankfulness. And he says, because I want you to have a peaceful life. So what he's saying is that when you pray for your leaders, which is illustrated with uh, Stephen's prayer for Saul, When you pray for leaders, something happens to their life, regardless of their value system. Something potentially happens in leaders' lives where they begin to make decisions that create an atmosphere, if you will, for the church to thrive in, for people to thrive in, citizens to thrive in. So he says this, he says, pray for the leaders with thankfulness because you're to live a peaceful life. And then he takes it a step farther and he says, because God wants all men to be saved. So work through the logic with me. Pray, I want you to live in peace, and I want revival to come to all the people. Can increase come through persecution? Yes, of course. But persecution is plan B. Plan A is a life where you actually get to thrive as families, thrive in business, thrive in all these ways. But it's so hard in history to actually succeed at thriving in all these things and maintaining a sense of focus, maintain a sense of values. It's the people that are on the front lines of battle that just have their priorities sorted. So learning to maintain that sense of priority and focus in a season of blessing is like the rarest thing in church history. But we got it right here. We got it right here. He says, the churches in Samaria, Judea, all these places, they were edified and they were in peace. Why? Because this guy named Saul got saved. How did that happen? Stephen interceded for him. He prayed for him. I personally think, I I don't know that I can prove it, but I, I personally think that there are demonic powers this, this you would believe, there are demonic powers that oftentimes influence regions of the world but they have a resonance or a root system in the life of an individual. That's why the man of the Gadarenes, when Jesus set him free, the demons cried out and said, don't send us out of the region. And so then he cast them out. They went into pigs. Pigs went and drowned, which is just, the scripture says demons search for waterless places. You've got to understand humor from God's perspective. (laughs) Demons look for waterless places. Jesus 
puts the demons and the pigs and they go kill themselves in the sea and they drown. I just think that's hilarious. God says, you want a waterless place? Try the pig. <laughs> I don't know. I, it'll, it'll probably be funnier when you get the videotape and you get to replay it. But. <clears throat> so when that man was set free, the man of the Gadarenes, when he was set free, the next time Jesus went into the area, every person in the region came to hear him speak. But when Jesus first came, when that man was set free, everybody opposed Jesus and drove him out of town. What happened? The power that was rooted in an individual that controlled the atmosphere of a region was broken. I don't know that it would be proper to say, but we certainly see a zeal against the work of Christ in the earth, in Saul. And when that thing was broken, peace was released. But here's the two things I want you to see. In Acts 2, the scripture gives us four insights as to what kept the church pure and strong. I think it's in verse 42. He says, and they continued in the apostles' doctrine to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to prayers. So four things. Apostles' doctrine. There's not a list of doctrines there. So I, I think it's what the Lord is saying in that particular season what he's emphasizing, apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, it's the sharing of meals together, it's explained uh, more deeply later, uh, fellowship, it's the exchange of life, one member to another, and prayers, plural. That's what kept them strong in the middle of adversity. But what, is what, what kept them strong in a place of peace? I'm glad you asked that question. It's the second half of verse 31 and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church is multiplied. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Those two issues were the, the two gauges on the dashboard that they had to make sure were in the right place, were healthy. That way they could make sure that they could maintain in a season of increase in blessing, they could still maintain the same focus and bring about an even greater harvest of souls to the church. How did they do it? Fear of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Comfort of the Holy Spirit is, that, is walking with that abiding presence where you are aware of what he's wanting not only to lead you in, but to bring peace and the comfort to. He comforts because not everything works the way we think it should the first time we try. Otherwise, otherwise he doesn't need to comfort. All things work together for good. That great scripture in Romans 8. We don't even need that verse if everything works the way we think it should the first time we pray. We need that because we've been called to navigate a journey. <clears throat> so here we've got this insight, fear of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Let me mention the fear of God. I, I know I've shared this with you several times in the last couple of years, but there's, there's some teaching going around that says there's no fear of God in the New Testament, which I think is hilarious because it's all through the New Testament. But, but anyway, um, you know, anyone who lacks a fear of God, just read your Bible. It'll help, believe me. Just, uh, you know, it's, we, just a lot of stupid things get created theologically by people who don't read their Bible. It's just careless imagination away from Scripture. And if you read something that you disagree with, adjust, because he's right. <laughs> just, just don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Well, Paul didn't understand the words of Jesus. Oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Slap yourself. I, she's, don't, so don't get me started. <laughs> People say, oh, there's errors in the Bible. There's not as many errors in there as there is in you. So I will hold to this standard before I hold to yours. I will not let the lesser reinterpret the greater. It's just not going to happen. So, all right. I feel better now. Now, let me explain. The fear, the fear of God. People say there's no fear of God in the New Testament. Well, if you don't read your Bible, you could believe that, but it's in there. But anyway, they get it from 1 John where it says there's no fear in love. And the conclusion is, that if you have a love relationship with God, you can't fear him because you can't fear the one you love. 
And whoever made that up is obviously not married. That person's going to be single a long time. My wife and I celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary yesterday. Yes, we did. 45 years, I love her and she scares me. And we'll leave it right there. The fear of God. The fear of God and the comfort, the abiding, feeding presence of the Spirit of God is what enabled people that succeeded to succeed more. That's it. That's it. It wasn't a list of four things this time. Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers. It was two things. Fear of God. The abiding presence. Comfort. Do those two things. Keep those two gauges dialed up. And God can trust you with increase because you'll know where it came from and you know the purpose. So my prayer is that God would enable each of us to navigate the seasons that we're in well. I mean, I, I've, I've talked about this from one angle or another for the last quite a few years because it's, it's just always on my mind because I see breakthrough come and then I see him wanting to bring greater increase, greater miracles, greater conversions, and then he wants to bring more. So I'm always curious about what is it? What is the condition of the people of God that would, I don't know if, if it's the right word is to free God or enable God or whatever, to trust even more, to entrust to us more? That's, that's my big question. So I pray that the Lord would release a grace over each one of us, a grace for the fear of God in ways we've we've never known before. I'm actually writing a book right now on raising kids. It's called uh, Raising Giant Killers. We're just going to go for the juggler vein. Raising Giant Killers. Come on. And one of the premier lessons that we teach children is that they will give an account of their life to God. It's, it's not to be morbid. It's not to be gruesome. It's not to be manipulative. But it, but it is true. We give an account of our lives to God. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk in the beauty of the, of the fear of God. In the beauty of the fear of God. You know, uh, when, we, uh, when our kids were small and whenever discipline was needed, you know, if discipline is done right, that child would want to sit on my lap the rest of the evening. Because... The fear of God actually endears us to him, doesn't drive us from it. So Lord, I pray for that. I pray for that kind of grace on us as a people and an increased awareness of your presence. Now, the greatest miracle that could possibly happen today would be for anyone in this room that would say, Bill, I don't know what it is to be born again. I don't know what it is to be forgiven of sin. I don't know what it is to be a part of the family of God. I, I've never been a disciple, a follower of Jesus, but I want to be. I don't want to leave the building until I know I'm at peace with God, until I know that I've been forgiven, until I know that I've turned from my life to follow him. If there's anyone in the room, we had four people the first service this morning. If there's anyone in the room that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave until I know I'm right with God. If that's you, I want you just to put a hand up right where you are. We're just going to make agreement with you right here. Anyone else? Put your hand up real quick. So beautiful. It's the greatest thing ever. Greatest thing ever. Anyone else? Real quick. I want to make sure I don't miss anyone. All right, that's so, so cool. Let's stand together. If I missed anyone, I want to invite you to come up here. To my left, on your right, is a banner. We've got a team down here. I want them to be able to pray with you. It's not about 
membership at Bethel. It's about none of those things. It is simply about a relationship with Jesus. So I, I want uh, the one right here, just come on up here and they will talk with you and pray with you. If you have a friend with you, they can walk with you. But uh, have, them, have them come on up together. And uh, I want ministry team to come on up. And if you could hold your places for a moment, that will help us. And Tom will just uh, give us directions. Yeah, I'm so glad that you uh, watched this video. I do pray that it's a great, great strength and encouragement to you. And I've got a verse that really is my cry for all of us. And it's uh, Psalms 20, it's verse 4. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. That's my prayer. That's my prayer is that this would be the season of rich, rich fulfillment. Thanks for joining us.